Bibles to the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 19. Let's open in a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for bringing us here today to worship our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the great Messianic Deliverer, of whom those praise at the end of the tribulation for his victory over the enemy, the one who we praise, the one who saved us from the penalty of sin, the one who keeps us as we walk with him by the Holy Spirit and the one who will preserve us until the resurrection. So, Lord, we praise him as well today. And, Father, just guide us in this passage we cover today in the Psalms as it relates to our text. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we've completed our study of Revelation chapters 17 and 18, which deals with the destruction of Babylon at the end of the tribulation. We know that Babylon was destroyed in bold judgment number 7, as we saw at the end of chapter 16. And then it gives two chapters of great detail on Babylon, its power, and then how God defeats Babylon. We notice that the unbelievers mourned deeply over the destruction of Babylon, but heaven actually rejoices over it. So the rejoicing continued from chapter 18 into chapter 19. Remember how we closed last week. After these things, in verse 1 of chapter 19, After these things I heard something like a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Hallelujah. Didn't we just sing a hymn that said, say multiple hallelujahs to the Lord? That was well-timed. Hallelujah, salvation and glory and power belong to our God. Because His judgments are true and righteous. For He has judged the great harlot, that's Babylon, who is corrupting the earth with her immorality and has avenged the blood of his bondservants on her. Because remember, she was destroying God's people. A second time they said, Hallelujah! Her smoke rises up forever and ever. So now the rejoicing and worship of God continues in verse 4. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God, who sits on the throne, saying, Amen! Hallelujah! So the 24 elders represent the church in heaven, and I think the four living creatures are angelic beings who are also in heaven, and we studied all of this back in Revelation chapter 4. But both groups fall down in praise of God, saying, Amen, Amen is the root in Hebrew to believe, Um, comes into Greek as Amen, and then now we say Amen, and then Hallelujah is also what they proclaim. Verse 5 says, a voice came from the throne saying, give praise to our God and all you his bondservants, you who fear him, the small and the great. I think this voice that comes from the throne in verse 5 could be another angel who then calls the entire assembly to join the praise of God. Verse 6, it says, then I heard something, excuse me here. Then I heard something like the voice of a great multitude, like the sound of many waters, like the sound of a mighty or mighty peals of thunder, saying, what? Hallelujah. For the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give glory to Him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come and His bride has made herself ready. Verse 8, it was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen bright and clean, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. So I think you caught it. It was obvious how many times the word hallelujah occurs in these eight verses. Four times. And then there's a call to praise God and give Him glory in verse 5 and then in verse 7. So you can see them all highlighted in yellow, the words hallelujah, and then give praise to our God, which is what hallelujah is. Praise Yahweh. And then verse 7, let us rejoice and be glad and give the glory to Him. So you see this repeated over and over. So what do you think I want to cover today? I'm going to talk about some praise today. Hey, they're praising God's victory over the enemy 
and praise is so important in our daily lives and our corporate worship and so forth. So I want to focus on the praise of God. And I want to do so from Psalm 113. So let's turn to Psalm 113. I'll give you a minute to get there. Before we actually get into the very words of this short poem, it's only nine verses, I want to talk about some structure. So the Psalms have been divided into five books. Book one is Psalm 1 through 41. Book two, Psalm 42 through 72. Book 3 is Psalm 73 to 89. Book 4 is Psalm 90 to 106. And then the fifth book, as it's arranged, is Psalm 107, Psalms 107 to 150. 150 is the last one. So where are we? Where we're clearly in book 5. Psalm 113 is in that location. Now, some scholars have made some important observations related to the arrangement of the Psalms. And I I think this is important. Let me just give you a little intro on this, and then we'll get into the text. Dr. Michael Rydelnik, who's a Jew that's converted to Christ, I don't know how long ago, but does some incredible work. And he's got a book called The Messianic Hope. And on page 170 and 171, he said the following, Book 5 of the Psalter comprises Psalms 107 to 150. The first seven Psalms of Book 5 contain a discernible unit of thought, notice this, with Psalm 110 forming their focal point. Now, what's Psalm 110 about? I'm going to somebody who's been here and heard this. It's the Messiah. He's the king the ruler, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool of your feet. He's also the priest, the great priest in the manner of Melchizedek. So he's a king, priest, warrior. That's what Psalm 110 is about. But Rydelnik is saying Psalm 1, 107, 108, 109, point to the middle, and then it goes to 111, 112, 113. So what he says in the following, in this section of Psalms, Psalm 107 to 109, each contain a plea for deliverance. While each of the Psalms of 111 through 113 express praise for deliverance. So Psalm 110 is central to the thoughts of these Psalms since it reveals the Messiah as king, priest, and warrior. He is the answer to the supplication of God's people for rescue in Psalm 107 through 109. So they're playing for rescue. Well, who's the rescuer? Jesus, the deliverer. He then says, and the reasons for their praise... To God is found in Psalms 111 through 113, which we're in 113 today. So he says the point of Psalm 110's location in the Psalter is that Israel is to find the answer to their pleas for deliverance from opposition in the future Messiah. And it is to offer praise to God for the messianic redemption he provides. Shouldn't we do the same? I can look at this and say, yeah, we want deliverance. We should praise God for deliverance. As we look to Psalm 110, the Messianic Deliverer, who we know has saved us from our sins and who will deliver us in the future. So we're looking at Psalm 113 today, namely because of the hallelujah that's so prevalent related to our passage in Revelation. But this psalm expresses praise for God's deliverance provided by the Messiah Jesus Christ of Psalm 110, which has this similar pattern in Revelation because aren't they praising God? For his deliverance, and isn't in Revelation 19 the Messianic deliverer? And we're getting ready to see him in the text coming down uh, on the white horse to to defeat the enemy and bring God's people into the kingdom. So here's an outline for Psalm 113. The first three verses are an invitation to join the praise of Yahweh. Verses 4 through 6, the second movement, is the reason to praise Yahweh. 
He actually gives us a reason to do it. At number three, the third movement, verses seven through nine, a praise of Yahweh for His grace and concern for the needs of His people. And shouldn't we thank Him for that because we need His grace as He looks to us and helps us. So let's um, start with 113, 1 through 3. An invitation to join the praise of Yahweh. I like what Dr. Ron Allen said about this. He says, In the first movement, we're confronted at once with the message of the psalm. Praise is due the incomparable name of God. So, verse 1. Praise the Lord. Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. So it starts with hallelujah, hallelujah, avde Yahweh, hallelujah, et shem Yahweh. Praise the Lord, and then another halal, praise, O servants of the Lord, and then the same word for praise, praise the name of the Lord. So this psalm of descriptive praise, a praise for who God is and what He does, begins with the words, praise the Lord. And we know this in Hebrew, hallelujah. We just say hallelujah, hallelujah. It's also the word that ends the psalm in verse 9. What's your last phrase in verse 9? Hallelujah, the same words. Now, this root here, halal, halal means to praise It means to boast. It can mean to be boastful. In our passage, it says, Hallelujah. We spell it with a J, uh, but there's no J in Hebrew. It's Hallelujah. So this is a compound term using the plural imperative of halal to praise, coupled with the word Yah, the shortened form of Yahweh. So praise Yah or praise Yahweh. So this is a command to boast in Him, to praise in the, the Lord, to, to be boastful in His name. Uh, Paul says something similar in 1 Corinthians one thirty one. He says, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. So this is a call to praise Yahweh. And notice it's a call to do so by all His servants, all His servants. So the word for servant here is the Hebrew evid. Evid means a servant or a slave. And this refers to God's people here who have the privilege of being the servants of the living God. By the way, uh, we don't like this word servanthood much today, but it's the same word used of Messiah, the servant of Yahweh. In the servant songs of the book of Isaiah, and there's several. But I'll just quote you from one of those servant songs, Isaiah 42. Isaiah 42, 1 says, Behold my servant whom I uphold. That's the father speaking of the son. Behold my servant, he says, whom I uphold. My chosen one, so Jesus was chosen, in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. Remember when Jesus came? Uh, The Father sent the Spirit down as a dove and put it upon His Son at His baptism in Matthew 3. So I have put my Spirit upon Him and will bring forth justice. He will bring forth justice to the nations. In the servant song, the suffering servant of Isaiah 53, a central passage on the suffering servant, it says this in Isaiah 53, 11, As a result of the anguish of His soul, that's Jesus, He will see it and be satisfied. By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many, and he'll bear their iniquities. So Christ would die on the cross for our sins, so that we could then, through faith in him, receive the imputation of God's perfect righteousness and stand justified before him. So the Greek equivalent to servant or slave is doulos, and it's used for Christians who are to serve as bond slaves of Jesus Christ. You can see this in 2 Corinthians 4.5, 1 Peter 2.16, Revelation 1.1, 1, 1, we're called bond servants, Revelation 22.3. So in light of the negative view of servanthood and slavery in our culture, which is warranted in many places, servitude to the Lord, and I highlight that, servitude to the Lord, the greatest master of all, 
is the highest honor a believer can enjoy. Amen? Wouldn't you agree? And being servants of one another should be an expression of our call to serve our great master because we're told to do that. Jesus said the greatest among you is the one who serves. And that's exactly what he did. So this verb halal is also found two more times in verse 1. Praise, O servants of the Lord, and then praise the name of the Lord. So biblical praise can be both vocal and public. Dr. Ron Allen made this comment about this psalm. He says the word halal has the idea of excited boasting. In the Bible, praise is always vocal. Praise is a part of sharing what we know about God with others. Praise is something that builds the community. Praise is an essential part of Christian worship. This is a command of God. This should be our natural response to God and should bring us great joy in God. So as you think about this and you look at the Psalms and Hebrew praise and how they did it, I think when we sing together during the church service, we're praising God. And I just take you one, if not now, but remind you of Ephesians 5.18 that says, be filled with the Spirit. Well, if you see that main verb, be filled, it's followed by five participles which describe what that means and how many of those are dealing with corporate worship and singing praises to one another as we sing praises to God. Hallelujah. <laughs> it's the same thing. So we, when we sing together as we just did, uh, we're, we should be in our hearts praising God, but we do it publicly and vocally. After we close the service with our final song, sometimes we stay and talk with one another about the greatness of God or sharing things about the Lord, and isn't that praise? When we leave here today and see other people throughout the week and tell others about God, what He's done in our lives, whatever it is, isn't that praise? You're giving glory to the Lord. We can praise Him in prayer, whether we're alone in prayer or in a group setting praying together. We can praise the Lord that way. And as we pray, I think we ought to be recalling His majesty, recognizing His attributes, His perfections, praising Him for all He does for us, praising Him for all the spiritual blessings He has given us as salvation free of charge by His grace. Ephesians 1.3 says, we have every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies in Christ. And there's a lot you can do just with the book of Ephesians on worship. So even a simple statement, if you meant it and you said to somebody, God is good, you are praising the Lord. You just gave glory to Him. Because as, as Jesus said, there's only one who's good and that's God. So we can praise Him in so many ways and I think... Uh, we should more and more, but maybe you're doing it more during the week and don't even realize it. So verse 1 specifically tells us to praise the name of the Lord. What is this name? We will, Lord? Okay, but what does that name mean? What's the implication of this name? Well, the name of God translated Lord is Yahweh. And most of you know this. We, they'll say Y-H-W-H because the Hebrew is a consonantal text. They, they spoke vowels, and they eventually put them in later with the Masoretes. But these four root consonants in Hebrew are the name of God that belongs to Him alone. And we call it the sacred tetragrammaton, the four letters, the sacred four letters. So Hebrew goes right to left. You have Y-H-W-H. Uh, a lot of scholars think it was pronounced Yahweh. So this is the covenant name of God. It's a name that shows up eight times in this short psalm. Only nine verses, and you see it eight times here. Yahweh is the covenant name of God, and that's a name that belongs to Him alone. There's other names for God, like Elohim. It is used for Him, but it is used for angels. Sometimes it's used of people. Context determines. That does not mean angels are God, the living God or deity, or that people are, but the name is interchangeable. However, Yahweh only refers to the living God and no one else. Isaiah 42, 8, I am Yahweh, that is my name. So there's the name Yahweh. I will not give my glory to another, nor my praise to graven images. So 
The name of Yahweh, let's go to Exodus 3, the name Yahweh is the memorial name that God wanted His covenant people, Israel, to remember Him by. This is a, one of my favorite texts on the name of God. So let's go to Exodus 3. So when we're to praise Yahweh, who is Yahweh that we're praising? <clears throat> I'm going to argue we're commanded to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Isn't Jesus Yahweh? So we're fulfilling a command today to know this. To, to think deeply about the person of God. Sometimes we need to do that as we're dealing with our own lives so we'll get a better perspective of what's going on in life and how important He is in the midst of it. So Exodus 3.14, we know the story. The Jews have been in slavery in Egypt. God will uh, meet Moses on uh, Mount Sinai at the burning bush. God's going to send Moses back to Egypt to get his people and bring them back to Mount Sinai. And God says, I will be with you. And Moses says, well, when I go to the people, who do I tell them you are? What is your name? I love this. Verse 14, this is what God said to tell them. God said to Moses, Ehyeh, Esher, Ehyeh. I am, not that I am, it's a personal name. I am who I am. Is that what you have in your Bible? So your name is a verb? Isn't that a to-be verb? I am, first person. What's third person? He is. Third person singular. And then you got, you got we are, y'all, I like y'all are, they are, I am, you are. Those are all forms of a to-be verb. We have a to-be verb. And what's a to-be verb? It's a verb of existence. What does this tell you about God? He just exists. He has no beginning or end. He is. I am, he says. And he said, you shall say to the sons of Israel, Eh, yes, I am has sent me to y'all. Again, your name is a verb. I am. Well, look at verse 15. Also on the slide, God, that's Elohim, God said again to him, to Moses, thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, here it is, Yahweh, there's the four sacred consonants, Yahweh, the God of your fathers, namely the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. And here it is, Zeshemi le'olam, Vizay zikri lador dor. This is my name forever. This is my memorial name. Uh, a zikri would be, uh, zakar means to remember, where we get the name Zechariah, Yahweh remembers. So his memorial name to remember him by is what? Not Elohim. Yahweh. He says, I'm the Lord, the God of your fathers. This is my name forever. Isaiah 42, 8, this is my name. I won't share my glory with another. And this is my memorial name to all generations. So we're told in the psalm, Psalm 113, to praise Yahweh, to praise his name. That name has a lot of weight to it. Now, I want to make a point here because sometimes I spend the whole hour just on this point, uh, this development. I agree with several scholars that have developed this that are far greater with the Hebrew language than I am. But do you see I am in verse 14? It's ehya. It's the first person of the to be verb haya in Hebrew. They're arguing that the name Lord is the third person of that same root. It's still the same verb, hayah, the to be verb, but now instead of I am, it's he is. And if you notice, in the four consonants, that first little small letter is a yod. That, that can indicate a third person verb in Hebrew. So when God speaks to Moses, what does he call himself? I am because he is, right? 
but he's talking personally, so he would put it in the first person. When we talk about him, we say what? He is. So they're seeing an etymological connection with these two words. So Yahweh refers to the living God with no end or beginning. No one created him. He's the ever-present, self-existent God. So if he's at Sinai with Moses, don't worry. I'll be with you when you go back to Egypt, and I'll bring you right back here. I will be with you because I am, and I always will be, and I always was. How's that for to be verb confusion? (laughs) So this is no ordinary name, is it? It's a verb of existence stressing that Yahweh is ever-present and self-existent. And verse 15 clearly says it's God's memorial name by which he was to be remembered forever. So now let's jump over to Exodus 34. Because the same name that God directly reveals to Moses when he was at Sinai in chapter 3 is revealed again in Exodus 34. Has anything happened between Exodus 3 and Exodus 34? A lot lot has gone on, right? Moses goes back to get the people. God, through Moses, gives the message to Pharaoh. Ten plagues are rained down. Pharaoh lets the people go. They go back to Sinai. Exodus 19, they get the law of Moses through, uh, what, 31, 18, written by the finger of God. But then the Jews play the harlot with a golden calf in Exodus 32. Moses comes down, smashes the tablets, remember, in anger. And then um, God is going to give him another set of tablets, Exodus 34. Now, I said that in, what, 30 seconds, but you need to go back and read that history. It's amazing. So verse 1, by the way, some scholars have said that Exodus 34 contains the most important passage on the self-revelation of God in the Bible because God verbally tells Moses out of his own mouth who he is. Could you imagine being Moses on this mountain talking to God and hear hear his voice say this? But verse 1, Now Yahweh, there's the covenant name, said to Moses, Cut out for yourselves two stone tablets like the former ones, and I will write on these tablets the words which were on the former tablets which you shattered. So back in... Exodus 32, 19, Moses sees them committing idolatry with the golden calf, smashes the tablets. So he says, be ready by morning and come up in the morning to Mount Sinai and present yourself there to me on top of the mountain. Now, no man is to come up with you, nor let any man see anywhere, be seen anywhere on the mountain. Even the flocks and the herds may not graze in front of that mountain. So he cut two stone tablets like the former ones, and Moses rose up early in the morning and went up to Mount Sinai, and as Yahweh, the Lord, had commanded him, and he took two stone tablets in his hand. Now, by the way, I want to say this to you for help. In verse 4, for example, do you see Lord? Is it in all four caps? Okay, we do that in English translations to show you that's Yahweh in the Hebrew. If you have capital L, small O-R-D, that's going to be Adon. We often say Adonai, my Lord. Uh, Here we have Yahweh, and every time in uh, most English translations, you see all four letters capitalized. They're telling you underneath is the sacred name. So here it is, verse 5. So Yahweh descended in the cloud and stood there in front of him as as Moses called on the name of the Lord. So the omnipresent God makes a visible appearance to Moses in this covering or enshrouding cloud as a symbol of his glory. Because remember, the glory appeared in the cloud all the time. It's his holiness, his presence, as Moses calls on the name of the Lord. Now, most Christians think calling on the name of the Lord simply means the unbeliever believing in Jesus and getting saved. I question if you can find any use of that in the Bible. What calling on the name of the Lord is in the Old and New Testament is an already saved person calling on God for help in worship or something like that. So who's calling on the name of the Lord here? Moses. Is Moses saved? Yes, he's a child of God, so he's worshiping the Lord. 
And what a time to worship when this cloud descends on the mountain right in front of you. This glory appears. I think we would all do that. So verse 6, here it is. Then Yahweh passed in front of him, whatever that was like, and Yahweh proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth. One of the best verses in the Bible. So God verbally and audibly proclaimed to Moses his name, right? The covenant name of Yahweh from Exodus 3, 14 and 15. The great I am communicates his memorial name right to Moses verbally. And notice he also proclaimed the character associated with his covenant name. Do you want to know who God is and what he's like? This is a text for that. And in a very unique and emphatic way, I think from the Hebrew text, God proclaims his name twice. I don't know how you have it um, punctuated, but he says, Yahweh, Yahweh. No comma or interruption, right? With some scholars contending that this is the only place in the Hebrew Bible where the name Yahweh is doubled together in such a way. And that's a fascinating point. Um, there's one other place in Isaiah 12.2, but it doesn't use the full name. Isaiah 12.2, you'll find Yah Yahweh, not Yahweh Yahweh. But it doesn't double the full name Yahweh like we have in Exodus 34.6. That seems to be exclusive here. And then Yahweh refers to himself as Right? He says, Yahweh, Yahweh. Then he says, Ael. Ael is a name for God. And now he gives the description of his being. You want to know what God is like? Well, he first says, Rachum vechanun. Compa- Do you have compassionate and gracious? Oh, I thought we only had a mean, angry God in the Old Testament. Now he's nice in the new. Have you ever heard that? Well, he's, he's gracious and compassionate in the Old and New Testament, and he's a God of judgment in the Old and the New Testament. By the way, last time I looked, when Jesus comes back on the white horse, it, it's judgment, right? So we've got to balance our view of God. It isn't this angry Old Testament God, and now we've got a nice God in the New. Blasphemy. He's a God of grace. He always has been and always will be. But he's also a God of judgment and among other attributes. So compassionate and gracious are closely related in meaning. Some even think they're synonymous here. Others have argued that this is a hendiades, where you put two words together to emphasize a central point, that God is immensely gracious. No doubt he's a gracious God and full of compassion. Next, he describes himself. Notice this isn't Moses making this up. God says also, I am Eric Apayim. You know what that means in Hebrew? Long of nose. He's long of nose? Well, this is an idiom emphasizing patience and long-suffering. In Hebrew, somebody, Ketzer Apium, was a short-nosed person. In other words, he had a quick temper. What would we say today? Hot head, short fuse. We have our idioms too. So here God describes himself as long-suffering and patient. That should have been an amen, hallelujah. Because isn't he that way with all of us? I've lived 31 years as a Christian, 58 years on this planet, and I am still alive because of the grace of God. What a, what a long-suffering God. As we say, how many do-overs are you going to give me? Confess your sin and come back. He's not approving of sin in any way, but he's very merciful and gracious. Just like you would be with your kids, knowing when they're sh- small and needing training, you are very patient with them so they can grow. Because if you took them out in the first failure, how would they ever grow up? And if God did that with us, how would we ever grow? Incredibly long of nose, if you will. And then he says in the last part, Verav chesed va'emet, that y'all know the word chesed, his loyal covenant love. But he's abounding. Verav means exceedingly or abounding in it. And this word chesed is loyal love, kindness, loving kindness, benevolence. Some translate it mercy. 
I like loyal covenant love. And then you have the word emmet. This, um, this is a word for uh, firmness. It can mean reliability or faithfulness or truth. So every time you go back to God, he's always what? He's truthful and firm, faithful and reliable. Can you say that about anyone in this world perfectly? Zero. Don't, don't ever even say it about me. I'm not perfect either. Your, your own parents, your, your favorite person in life isn't perfectly reliable. And we come and go, don't we? God takes us home sometimes, and now who do you rely on? Him. He's the one we look to. God is training us for this world by focusing on Him above all things and putting everything else in perspective under Him. So, an amazing description of who God is. So, in Exodus 34, 6, the Lord gives an audible self-description of His character to Moses, which was actually inscripturated by Moses himself, who wrote down all five books of Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And we know all Scripture is God-breathed, 2 Timothy 3.16. And first, uh, 2 Peter 1.20 20 and 21 says the writers of Scripture were carried by the Holy Spirit. So this is Holy Scripture. It's written down by the prophet Moses, but it's God's Word about himself. Um, I liked how Dr. Allen described Exodus 34.6. He says, this is the definitive self-disclosure of the person of our God in Torah. This is how God desires to be known by His people. This is what God wants us to see about Him. Is He a God of judgment? Yes, but this is His character. And He wants us to know that. So some people say, well, don't go to the Old Testament for God's character. You'll just get anger back there and all kinds of, you know, just judgment. That is not true. What do you do with this? So to up this up a notch... This self-description of God to Moses is picked up by the Apostle John who applies it to Jesus Christ, who I think was the one talking to Moses back um, in Exodus 34. So John 1.14, watch the connection. And the Word became flesh. John 1.1 says Jesus is eternal as the Word, right? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. That would be with God the Father, who's eternal, And the Word was God, or kept on being God. So is Jesus eternal? He is God. He is the Word. He is the second person of the Trinity. But verse 14 says, the Word, the Logos from verse 1, became flesh at a point of time. The verb even changes, became as a point of time. So he became humanity. So he didn't lose his deity. Deity acquired humanity. Now he's the God-man undiminished deity and true humanity in one person forever. So the Word became flesh, and what did He do? He dwelt among us, and that's a word to tabernacle. He tabernacled among us, and we saw His glory. Wait a minute, tabernacling in glory? Isn't this the same glory that descended in Exodus 34 in the cloud? And it's the same glory that dwelt in the tabernacle of Exodus 40. And now Jesus is tabernacling in a human body, embodying the glory of God. If he walked in here, who is he? That's the I am. Now he's glorified. He's in a resurrection body. But even before his resurrection, that is the God-man, the glory of God right there. And notice, glory is the only one from the Father, John 1.14 says, full of grace and truth. Pleres charitas kai alitheas. Where does that come from? Abounding in loving kindness and truth. Same description now given to Jesus. So we know what God is like from Exodus 34.6, a God of glory and grace, full of loving kindness and truth. But what about Jesus? What is Jesus like? Jesus is just like God, right? John 1.14, a God of glory, full of grace and truth. Has your mind wrapped around this? You know, it's been rightly said, if you want to know what God is like, look at Jesus. 
If you want to know what Jesus is like, look at God. So when we praise Yahweh, back in our psalm, we're praising a self-existent, ever-present God. The only true God. A God of loyal love. A God who's eternal. The creator of all things. A God who keeps covenant promises. A personal, omnipresent God who's present everywhere at all times, who actively relates to his people. And by the way, you can do a study on Yahweh of its hundreds of occurrences, and you'll see all these concepts attached to that name. So when I hear the name Lord, I'm thinking of this Yahweh who's ever present, the self existent God, the great I am who is connected to every one of these things. Do you see when you praise God, the more you know about Him, the more you can do it with depth? And then, not that you couldn't praise Him the day after salvation, you could. But the more you know, the deeper it is. And how can you really worship some, the Lord if you don't know Him? How can you follow Him if you don't know what He wants you to do? We need, by the way, let me ask this. Can you know too much about the Bible? You can't. And you can't apply too much either. God's never going to say, quit loving so much. Back off. Slow down. No, again, with sin, there's laws against it. But not against the fruits of the Spirit. Against such things, there is no law. Love, joy, patience, peace, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. And on and on. So back to Psalm 113. That's the longest discussion on a verse I'm going to do today. But let's go back to the psalm, Psalm 113, verses 2 and 3. So this call to praise Yahweh, hallelujah. And then what does he say about the name? Praise his name. Well, bless the, blessed be the name of the Lord. There's Yahweh again from this time and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of Yahweh is to be praised. Now, if you read these verses carefully, and I'm going to step out here, it seems best to understand verse 2 is giving the time factor of our praise, namely, from now on and forevermore. Verse 3, it could be a time element, but the more I look at it, I think it deals with geography. The geographical aspect of our praise, if it's simply time, some would argue, well, praising God is from sunrise to sunset, and if that refers to time, then you're only supposed to do it from morning till night, and that's it? Can you praise Him at night after you, the sun goes down? Have you ever praised Him in the middle of the night? So can we not praise Him at night? Some say, well, you're stretching that too far. It just means do it continually. Possibly, but I think from the rising and the setting of the sun emphasizes direction, east and west. So where does the sun rise? East, it sets in the west. Therefore, it's emphasizing geography. No matter where you are, you can do it. Do it all the time, verse 2, but no matter where you are geographically, you can do it. And people say, well, of course you could, but a lot of people don't believe that. I've heard some Christians say, I can't praise God or even pray to Him unless I'm in church, in a building. And you show them some scriptures, say, no, you can do this 24-7 anywhere you are. And they're like, wow, I never knew that. They weren't taught. They were taught by someone else incorrectly. In some ancient cultures, if you changed geographical locations, you had to change gods. They were territorial. That's why in 1 Kings, it's interesting, Baal is the God of that region in Elijah's day. But what does God do? Comes into his territory on his turf and defeats him through one of his prophets. So they had a territorial view of God, and God says, I'm, not ter- I, I'm sovereign over the universe, including the earth. So Yahweh is our ever-present God. So wherever you might be geographically, he can and is to be praised. So our praise shouldn't be limited to a church service on Sunday morning. We can do it at home. We can do it on the way to work, in a walk in the park, 
even on a business trip overseas, because doesn't God rule there too? No geographical boundaries. Um, y'all remember Jeannie Terhune? Some of you remember her when she was with us. She, she died several years ago, went to be with the Lord. She was the person that just drove by the church, went to a Tuesday Bible study and never left. I mean, she went home, but, but she, she just stayed at the church. And she loved the Lord and just wanted to learn about Him. And, um, and she used to encourage me with my jail ministry. She goes, when you go into the jail ministry, just tell them it's all geography. That's all it is. It's just geography. God is right here with you. You can worship Him here. Don't wait till you get out. And it's true. I think this fits this psalm. God, from one corner, from, what does it say? Uh, uh, from east, as far as his east is from the west, he's removed our transgressions. Uh, he's just, no matter where we are, he is. And I hope they never get to Mars, but if you could, could you worship Yahweh there? Sure you could. You could go, I, I'm staying here. <laughs> Mars doesn't look appealing. So with our ever-present God, we can praise Him wherever we are and at any time. You know, speaking of the jail, one night I did go in, and one of the pods, I just simply taught the I Am for an hour from Exodus 3, and I just asked out loud, who can apply this to your life? You know what one guy said? One of the toughest guys in the room, loaded with tattoos, you know, you're thinking, oh, you have to be scholars. And no, he said, you know what? If he's the ever-present God, then he's here with me now. And if I have to go to TDC and they lock me away in solitary, he'll be there too. Thank you. Thank you. What about you? He's with you wherever you go. He's not confined to, t to time and space. He can meet with Moses on Sinai, but is he still taking care of the affairs of the universe? I can't, do, I can't chew gum and walk at the same time. My mom could do pretty good, but she wasn't God. She could cook and discipline us and do, do laundry all in the same moment. <laughs> but you get my point. God, if, if we all, a million people prayed at one time, does he go, ooh, if two people are talking to me one at a time? No, he just, he answers them all simultaneously. This is who God is. So now we come to Psalm 113, 4 through 6. The reason for the praise of Yahweh. He doesn't just bark a command and say, don't worry about it, just do it. No, he'll tell you why. So this psalm gives the who, the what, the when, the where, and the why. The who is Yahweh, that's who we praise. The what is the command to praise in verse 1. Hallelujah, remember halal is an imperative. Praise Yahweh. The when is now and forevermore, verse 2. The where is anywhere geographically from the rising of the sun to its setting. Verse 3. And the why is verses 4 through 6. Now check out verse 4 through 6. So Yahweh is high above all the nations. His glory is above the heavens. So many among the nations worship these so-called gods. But Yahweh is the living God where? Al Kol Goyim, he's above all the nations. So is he greater? He transcends all geographical boundaries. And then verse 5 and 6, who is like the Lord our God? There's Yahweh again. Who is enthroned on high, who humbles himself to behold the things that are in heaven and in the earth. So the answer to the question in verse 5 is what? Who is like our God? No one. Our God is incomparable. To whom would you even compare him? I like Isaiah 44, 6 through 8. Thus says Yahweh, the King of Israel and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first, I am the last. There is no God besides me. Who is like me, he says. Let him proclaim and declare it. Yes, let him recount it to me in order from this time that I have established the ancient nation. 
and let them declare to them the things that are coming and the events that are going to take place. Do not tremble, don't be afraid. Have I not long since announced it to you and declared it? Are you, are you not my witnesses? Is there any God besides me or is there any rock? God says, I know of none. So look at verse 6. It describes God as humbling himself to behold the things that are in heaven and on earth. Are you listening to this? How big is God? I mean, we look up to the heavens and go, wow. He looks down on heaven and has to stoop down to see it. So this Hebrew poetry, because all this is poetry, describes God and his transcendent glory. He's within his world. He's eminent, but he's transcendent. He's beyond it. It describes him bending or stooping over to see the things of the heavens and the earth, which is a way of describing the universe. Now, who created the universe? I heard God. Amen. Amen, right? <laughs> From the youngest person in here. Hey, if a little child learns that, that is the beginning if they don't know that God is God and we're not, they're going to be in big trouble the rest of their lives. Genesis 1-1 is the first thing I would want my child to know. He's God, you're not, and you never will be. And he always will be. So God creates this giant universe, the heavens and the earth, Genesis 1-1. And I don't know how we can even measure how big that is. It's not eternal because God's third heaven beyond the universe is not part of this universe. So the universe isn't eternal. It does have a finite aspect to it, and I don't know how far it goes. I mean, they think, well, we'll get to Mars. That's like going from here to Amarillo, right? It's nothing. Eh, not even that far. How about Victoria? So he's the creator God of the universe, and the psalmist describes God as bending over in condescension to look down on it. Kind of reminds me when God dispersed the Tower of Babel. It says he came down. So this massive living God just comes down to disperse it. It's no big deal. He can get rid of it and control anything he wants. So God is eternal and so immense that he has to humble himself to behold his own creation. And notice verse 4 says that, the, that God's glory is even above the heavens. Al Hashemayim Kavodo. His glory above the heavens. And so it even transcends the universe he created. This reminded me of Deuteronomy 4 this week. A chapter devoted in the Torah to the futility of worshiping false gods and to never fall into idolatry. So God says to the Jews, which applies to us here, beware Remember, he's sending, Moses is writing this by the power of God, by the Spirit, and they're about to go into the promised land. So when, you establish, when God establishes you in the land, do not follow these false gods that they worship there. Now, they just came out of Egypt and they didn't worship false gods, right? That's all they did. And now they're going to another place that does it. And he said, remember this, beware, do not lift up your eyes to heaven and see the sun and the moon and the stars and all the host of heaven. Well, he's not warning them not to get a telescope out and look. Keep reading. And be drawn away and worship them and serve them. Can't we look at them and praise God because he made them? And I think we should. But don't worship them. Those which Yahweh your God has allotted to all the peoples under the whole heaven. So Romans 1 says they worship the creator. They, I'm sorry, the creature rather than the creator. That's terrible. Romans, what, 125? So they're not to worship the creation, but they're to marvel at the living God who created it. So as we look up at the universe, we only look at a little tiny piece, right? I mean, the other day I was looking up, it was a clear night, and who was out here? I think it was Greg and I. We were out here in the parking lot looking up, and we were talking about, think if you were in like West Texas or something where there are no street lights, how much you could see. But we're only looking at a portion, right? 
So as we look up to it and even look at a small portion of it, and I don't care if you're using the Hubble telescope, that's all it's getting is a portion, we marvel in amazement of how vast it really is. But think of the opposite here. For God to look at billions of stars in the galaxies that He created, He's condescending to it in His being. He's stooping down to look at it. So next time you think you're big, God is bigger. <laughs> Remember Dr. Bayless at seminary, he went to the chalkboard one, one day and he drew this huge circle. And then he drew this little tiny one. And he goes, you know what my problem is? He was very humble. He goes, I'm the big circle and I think God is the little circle sometimes. He goes, I need to get that backwards. I need to swap this and get God bigger than that circle compared to me. But you see his point. He goes, sometimes I'm just walking around thinking I'm that big circle and God's this little one somewhere. And then you read a verse like this and I can't draw a circle big enough about his greatness. So now we get to the last movement. So go back to Psalm 113. If I don't think I told you to leave there, did I? So verses 7 through 9, a praise of Yahweh for His grace and concern for the needs of His people. So as God stoops down to even see the vast universe He created, He even stoops down lower <laughs> to help the people of His creation on earth. Why? Because He truly cares. Some people don't believe that, but I think He does. Listen to what David, King David said, in Psalm 8, and I'm sure, how many times did that shepherd, David, look up to the heavens at night, to the moon and the stars? But he says in Psalm 8, 1, O Yahweh, our Lord, how majestic is your name. So he's, he's calling on the name, recognizing the name. He's praising the name, as Psalm 113 says. How majestic is your name in all the earth, who have displayed your splendor, notice, above the heavens. So he's imminent within his world. He's transcendent beyond it. So his splendor goes beyond the universe. Psalm 113.4, his glory is above the heavens. And then in verse 3, he says, When I consider your heavens, so as I look at this creation you made, the work of your fingers, his handiwork, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, David says, What is man that you take thought of him? And the son of man that you care for him. And the answer to that is God does care because God created man to rule. God created man in his image, so man is the highest creature God ever made, Genesis 1. Of course, Adam failed in his rule, Satan now rules, but God will restore a man to his place of honor and dignity and rule when Jesus comes back to rule. So God does care, and David understood that. So God has an incomparable name. He's got an incomparable essence. He even has incomparable care and concern for us. And if you don't understand that, you need to grow up spiritually into that to see that God does really care. And sometimes we say he's so silent, but he cares. He's always there and he does care. In his silence, I go to his word. There's where his audible voice comes through in the Holy Scriptures, right? If that's really his word, then he's talking to us through the scriptures. So the extent of his gracious concern is described in the last movement of the psalm. So verse 7 and 8. He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes, with the princes of his people. So God not only condescends to see his universe, but he'll actually condescend further coming into a world of fallen men to help the needy. And we say, oh God, there's no, there's, there couldn't be a God that's personal, and people say that. No, we have a very personal God that actually became one of us and died for our sins. He's one that can identify with all of our weaknesses and infirmities because he became one of us and experienced suffering and temptation. So God comes into our existence, and it says in the poetry here, He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes and the princes of His people. 
So the first illustration of how God cares for those of this world is the poor man. Now, commentators have said this about a poor man in the ancient world. The poor would stay near the trash heap outside the city for warmth from the constant burning of the trash. So they'd burn the refuse and the trash outside the city. So that would create warmth. Warmth so the uh, poor man would go there for that on a cold night. But they'd also seek food from the garbage. Eh, Something similar today, you'll find a homeless person trying to find warmth and maybe going through the garbage to find something to eat. So God stoops down to take the most needy and destitute, and it says he seats them with the nobles. What, are you going to bring them into the palace and put them at the king's table? You know, I look at this, and I think that's what God did with us at salvation. I mean, how were we outside of Christ? Dead in our trespasses and sins. We were in a lost, dark, spiritual, unspiritual dung heap, right? Right? All of us would have fallen short of the glory of God, and yet through faith in the gospel, God sends His own Son, who comes down and humbles Himself to go to a cross, bears our sins so that faith in Him would bring us to His royal table. And now we can eat royal food called the Word of God. Now we have every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies, Ephesians 1.3. How do you like that? That's who God is. That's what He did. He could have left us, hey, you guys sin, I'm done with you. Have at it, and when you die, you'll go to eternal judgment. He didn't do that. So as I look at this, God, God said, don't ever defer to the, to the needy or the wealthy. Don't overemphasize one over the other. He cares for both, right? He was very clear about that. Deuteronomy ten seventeen, For the Lord, or Yahweh your God, is the God of gods and the Lord of lords. The great, the mighty, the awesome God who does not show partiality or take a bribe. So God is completely fair with everybody and he cares for the wealthy and the poor. Some think if you're wealthy, some Christians will say God hates you, he doesn't going to help you. That's not true. But the needy in the ancient culture were often left with no help. An orphan had no one to call mom or dad. The, the, the widow had no husband to help her, and in that culture, that was difficult. A barren woman was unhappy because she had no children and couldn't bear. So God comes into that situation in our text to show how he does care. So I don't think this is a rejection of levels of authority, because doesn't God have levels of authority in his plan? Absolutely. Um, I think of King David. Was K- David the king in Israel, right? Who did he call to eat at his table? 2 Samuel 9. After getting the Davidic covenant of 2 Samuel 7, David says, who of Saul's household can I show chesed? Loyal love? Of Saul's household? He was your enemy. He was the one trying to kill you. And so who did they send? Remember Mephibosheth, the one that was dropped as a child and was crippled in two feet? David says, bring him in, because he made a covenant with Jonathan. But he brings him in and lets that man, this crippled man, sit at his table. And he dined at the royal table, eating the king's food. Is David still the king? Still an authority over him. But it's showing the character of David as he reflects his Lord, who is a God of chesed. So he's reflecting his Lord, even though there's an authority distinction. That is how God is doesn't play favorites or show partiality. I hope that was understandable. So verse 9, the last verse, speaking of the Lord, he makes the barren woman abide in the house as a joyful mother of children. Praise the Lord. So this image of a barren woman would have been very well understood in this ancient culture. It strongly conveys a condition of great suffering in the ancient Hebrew culture. So a barren woman in that culture would be considered destitute and without significance, without a child. But God comes down to give her joy and significance. Now, can't you apply that in general to God comes down and gives us significance? I can't tell you how many men in the prison I've met that say, 
All I was told my whole life is that I'm useless and have no purpose. So I'll go to Genesis 1 and show him how God created him in his image, which indicates he has a tremendous purpose for you. And that lifts him up. I said, the world may tell you something, but God says if you're in my image, you do have a purpose and you do have significance. So I I was looking at this, and you know what this reminds me of? The song of Hannah. Remember Hannah was barren? 1 Samuel begins with Hannah having no child. She cannot produce. She's barren. And so God will give her a child named Samuel, one of the greatest prophets of all time. Not just a child. She gave him Samuel, who is one of the most important figures in the narrative of 1 Samuel. So Hannah, in the praise of God, in chapter 2 of 1 Samuel, in the first 10 verses, will sing a song of praise to the Lord for bringing forth joy in her life because now her barren womb was restored and brought forth a child. So here it is. You ought to go read 1 Samuel 2, 1 through 10. And, and now let's read the psalm and then go down and, what she, and listen to what she says and how this sounds like the same thing. So Psalm 113.7, He, God, raises the poor from the dust, lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes, with princes of his people. He makes the barren woman abide in the house of, as a joyful mother of children, praise the Lord. So here's Hannah, a barren woman who now has a child, and look what she says. I'm just going to go to verse 8, 1 Samuel 2.8. He raises the poor from the dust... He lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with the nobles. That's right out of Psalm 113 is coming right out of that. Now, Psalm 113 was written later um, from the time of Hannah. So the Holy Spirit's using this text, I think, as a background. And to inherit a seat of honor, just like David brought Mephibosheth to the table. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, so everything belongs to Him, and He set the world on them. Kind of also reminds me of Mary. Remember when she gets a child? She wasn't barren, but the Lord provided a child supernaturally through the Holy Spirit, which was Jesus, and then she sings a song of praise to the Lord. My soul magnifies the Lord. But no time to talk about Mary's song at this point. So the incomparable care and concern for the needs of mankind is reflective of Jesus Christ, the most humble one who ever lived, the second person of the Trinity, who we know humbly came to this world. The eternal God became flesh. He, he according to the prophecy of Zechariah 9.9, your king is coming. He's endowed with salvation, humble and mounted on a donkey. So he humbly comes to this earth. He humbly comes into Jerusalem to lay down his life. Philippians 2.8 says, Being found in the appearance as a man, he, Jesus, humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even the death of a cross. So Jesus died on that cross for all of us is an ultimate statement of humility. The sinless one humbled himself and bore all of our sins in his own body paid the penalty in full, and therefore rose from the dead and offers salvation to anyone who will simply believe in Him. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ who died on the cross for your sins and you will be saved. How many times have you thanked or praised God for Jesus coming to do that? And maybe you're doing it in your heart right now, thanking Him for it, and the Lord hears that praise. So the psalm ends with the same way it began. A call to praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So back to Revelation 19, the people during the tribulation are praising God for his defeat of the enemy. In the meantime, that hasn't happened yet. We're waiting for that final deliverance. But in the meantime, we can continue to praise him as we meet together each week. And we can praise him during the times of the week when we're not together, right? But no matter what day it is, from the rising of the sun to its setting, 
The Lord is to be praised, both now and forevermore. So for all time and no matter where we are, amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to come worship you and praise your name. Hopefully each week when we meet, we're praising your name and the things we're reading. And we praise, in our, praise you in our hearts as we sing out loud our praises to you in song. So, Lord, we thank you. We can count our blessings. It would take days to go through what Scripture says, what you have done for us, what you're doing now, and what we, you will do for us for eternity. So may we praise you for that, con- constantly learning about who you are and what we have, and more and more praising you for it. In Jesus we pray, amen.